Acts chapter 15. I wonder if uh, somebody said to you this week, uh, what do you believe if you'd be able to tell them? Uh, Or if you'd be willing to tell them, come to that. Uh, Sometimes uh, we would love people to ask us, what do you believe? Uh, Sometimes we feel, particularly nowadays, with such a divided society, uh, perhaps sometimes we feel a little bit wary when people ask us, what do you believe, in case they're trying even to catch us out in some way. Uh, But it is a good question, and it's a question that we need to be able to answer if it's put to us. And I'd like to put that question this morning to the Apostle Peter, as if he was standing up here. There's so many microphones here, I'm sure you'd be able to find one of them to speak into, uh, that uh, if I was to say to him, right, Apostle Peter, what do you believe? And we have it in front of us here in Acts chapter 15, verse 11, how he would answer. Uh, He answered it 2,000 years ago. He'd answer, I'm sure, exactly the same today. Uh, Acts chapter 15, verse 11, but we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus just as they will. You notice there's a a we and a they in that answer uh, because uh, he lived in a divided society even more perhaps than we do. Uh, He lived in a society where he himself had grown up as a Jew Uh, But he knew that uh, there were people all around him who were non-Jews, Gentiles, they were called, people of the nations. And uh, the passage that uh, Mike read to us is about uh, a division that had been brought in from the world and was now uh, threatening the church. This division between Jew and Gentile. And although what we're reading about mainly here happened in Jerusalem, the discussion that went on, uh, it actually started 300 miles north of Jerusalem in Antioch. Uh, Antioch is still there. Uh, It's now part of southeastern Turkey. Uh, But in those days, it was a a great Roman city. Uh, If you've ever read the book or seen the film Ben-Hur, you'll remember the chariot race. Now, I always thought the chariot race took place in Rome, but it didn't. Uh, It took place in Antioch. Antioch was a great Roman city that was proud of its Roman buildings and its Roman theater. And, uh, And yet there were lots of Jews there. And so when Paul and Barnabas were sent out from the church in Antioch, on what we call the first missionary journey. Uh, It was back to Antioch that they came to report on the great things that had happened while they had been taking the gospel around uh, Cyprus and what we think of as as modern Turkey, Asia Minor. And so they came back to Antioch and they found that although there was great rejoicing that uh, many people had come to faith, there were some who were thinking there's something a bit wrong here uh, because this gospel, they've been now spreading it to Gentiles and we're not sure if this is right. They seem to be telling non-Jews that they can be saved without being Jewish, uh, without doing the Jewish things that are part of our Jewish traditions. Is that right? And so there was this division of opinion uh, that caused quite some difficulty and was likely to threaten the church, not just in Antioch, not just in Jerusalem, but the church throughout the world right up to the present day. And so this had to be sorted out. In a way, Acts chapter 15 acts as a sort of, as a sort of fulcrum or pivot in the book of Acts, because up until this stage, most of the preaching and most of the success in the preaching has been among Jews. Uh, But later, 
and right up to our own day, of course, the gospel has come to non-Jews. And this decision that was made in Acts chapter 15 is very important. It's very important to them. It's very important to us. And so when Peter says, we believe so-and-so just as they will, he's talking about we, Christians who are from a Jewish background like himself, they, Christians from a non-Jewish background like you and me. Very important. So you've got this this potential clash. And so we say to Peter, okay, let's try and get this sorted out now. Do we believe that we can be saved by the Lord Jesus Christ without going through all of these Jewish rituals and following the Jewish ways? That's the the basic question that, uh, that Peter is is trying to answer here what do you believe peter we believe that we'll be saved through the grace of the lord jesus just as they will and i'd like us to to go through that verse and look bit by bit at what he says he believes we can do then a checkup for ourselves do i believe that and really follow that through and say, well, what's the effect in my life for believing that? So, the first, first thing he says is that we believe that we will be saved. We believe that we will be saved. Now, he assumes, and all the people in this discussion assume that we need to be saved. Now, that means helplessness, doesn't it? It means being rescued from a place that we can't rescue ourselves. Imprisoned, no chance of escape. Tied up, if you like, locked in or trapped in some way. But he's talking here not about a physical entrapment, but he's talking about the future judgment of God. We need to be saved from the wrath of God upon sin and sinners. We need to be saved from an eternal separation from this God. Being saved means to be rescued from that judgment. Now, this need to be saved immediately divides a Christian believer from most other people around. We believe in sin and salvation. And our society generally tries to avoid making that division at all. But the people here who were in this discussion uh, in Antioch and then that went on into Jerusalem, they they were all Christians who believed in this. They, They saw this division. They saw we need to be saved. Their their difference was not the need to be saved, but how, the how of being saved. And uh, what Peter says here is, we will be saved. Being saved, the way he expressed it here, is something future. He's he's talking again, isn't he, about this future judgment of God. A Christian like Peter looks forward with confidence to the day of judgment. We will be. On the day that we stand at God's judgment throne, we will be saved. And that confidence has It has an effect, doesn't it, on on now. Although it's a future thing, it has an effect on now, on present behavior. It it means, as, as it did for Peter, it means that we can face danger. We can face fear. Uh, We can face 
uh, even death, as Peter had done. And as you read the early chapters of, of Acts, you know that Peter was uh, imprisoned at one time at risk of his life. But he could face that because he could say, well, we'll be saved. Uh, it means that you can befriend people who otherwise might be your natural enemies, as he had done uh, earlier when he went to the home of the Roman centurion Cornelius. Uh, Peter could say, well, I can go to these people because we will be saved. We'll be, we believe that we'll be saved. Uh, many of the fears and the uncertainties of life fall away. And if you're a b Christian believer today, you can say the same. There are things that unsettle us. There are things that frighten us. Of course, naturally they do. But over the whole of that, we can still say, but we've still got this confidence, we will be saved. And the we will be saved implies something else, and that is we can be saved whoever we are. We will be saved just as they will. And he's saying, whoever we are, wherever we come from, whatever has been in our past, uh, whatever problems there might be in our present and in our future, confidently, we will be saved. We can be saved, whoever we are. Perhaps you're somebody who is not sure how much you believe about the Christian gospel. And perhaps uh, there's something that pulls you back and makes you worry a little bit. Well, if I did start to believe this, what would it do to my life? Uh, but would God accept me anyway? Uh, because those people in the chapel, they don't know really what I'm like. Those people in the chapel, they don't know what I've done. Or perhaps you worry not so much about something that you've done, or even, but perhaps even something that was done to you. And it makes you think, well, can I be saved? Can that be wiped away? Can that be washed away? And what Peter is saying is here that we will be saved. Trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ we will be saved, we can be saved. This uh, fisherman from Galilee, who on the day of Pentecost stood up before thousands of people, could say, well, I've been transformed. I would never have thought I could speak to any more than two boatloads of fishermen. And here I am standing in Jerusalem. I don't know how many people I'm speaking to. What happened? Well, God changed him, didn't he? God transformed him. God gave him a new boldness, a, a new ability to speak, to, to teach, even to use language and languages in proclaiming this gospel of Jesus. We believe that we will be saved. But secondly... I don't know if I've got eyes in the back of my head, so I'm not sure if it's coming up on the screen behind me. Secondly, we, will be we believe that we'll be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus. The, the, the word grace, I don't know if you've noticed, but it's come up a number of times uh, during the service already. It's come into the songs that we've sung as well. Um, how will you be saved, Peter? That's the next question to ask him, isn't it? If he's up here, you say, okay, you say, Peter, we will be saved, but, but how can that happen? How will be saved? Well, it's through the grace of the Lord Jesus. Grace. It, it, it is a lovely word. It's a beautiful word. It's a word that, that involves kindness and mercy and freeness of gifts. Uh, it's a word that's um, in its original Latin term, we sometimes use as gratis, free, 
don't have to pay a gratuity. Uh, you know, you, you give a tip to the waitress in the, in the restaurant, don't you? It's a gratuity. It's grace. You don't have to, but you, you do. It's a gratuity. It's on your coins. Have you noticed, although that, the, write, the writing gets, seems to get smaller on our coins all the time, but it's still there. DG, by the grace of God, the king or queen reigns. The grace of God grace it's a gift and biblically it's a gift certainly that you cannot earn it's a gift that you can say I don't deserve it I can't claim in any way that I deserve it uh, do you remember from the Old Testament, there's the lovely story of, of Ruth, isn't there? And uh, there she is coming uh, as a foreigner with nothing. And she comes and she's gleaning in the field. And this man, Boaz, comes along. And he, and he keeps showing her kindness. He gives her things. And, he, uh, and then she says, well, I found favor in your eyes. Uh, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, though I'm not one of your servants. I'm lower than one of your servants, and yet you're showing kindness to me. And the word that's so often used in the Old Testament for grace is favor. And it's, and it's there in the book of Ruth. Favor. Boaz showed favor to Ruth that she in no way could have earned. And God shows favor to his people in a way that they could no way earn. But it's more than that. It's, that is giving you something that you don't deserve. There's more to grace in, the, in our gospel, isn't it? Because grace is also not giving you something that you do deserve. It's, t it's not giving you the punishment for your sin that you do, that you do deserve. So there's, a, there's two sides to grace, giving you what you don't deserve and not giving you what you do deserve. What a wonderful word this grace is. And well, in your Bible reading this week, I'm sure you'll spot it. You, you, you just let your eye look for grace. Or if you're reading in the Old Testament, look a bit more for, for the word favor. And you'll see it there. God giving you. And you can stop and you say, thank you, Lord. I, these, these things that you've given, I don't deserve them. In fact, I deserve the opposite. Grace. And Peter says, we believe that we'll be saved through the grace. This freeness of gift. Every step of God's salvation, says a, a very clever American scholar who... Uh, has come down out of his ivory tower to say something really wonderful here. Every step of God's salvation from eternity past to everlasting future is accomplished through grace. Every step from eternity past to everlasting future accomplished through grace. Now, grace is a characteristic of God, isn't it? As you read your New Testament and as you read your Old Testament, you keep finding th this link, the grace of God, the favor of the Lord. Noah found favor in the sight of the Lord. It goes right the way back all through your Old Testament. And you say, this is a characteristic of God. And so you can say to Peter now, is that what you say? We believe that we'll be saved through the grace of God. And Peter might scratch his beard the way that John Woolley does. And, he, and he'll say, well, I do believe that we'll be saved through the grace of God. But that's not exactly what I said. Look again. We believe that we'll be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus. Now, this is the heart of Christianity, isn't it? This is... This is what Christianity is all about. It's Jesus Christ, the things that he has done. And it's the Lord Jesus. Uh, we can really sum up our gospel very much by saying that our gospel is to do with who Jesus is and what he's done. Who Jesus is and what he's done. And who is he? Well, Peter says he's the Lord Jesus. 
And, and Peter has got very good reasons for saying that. You remember Peter had known Jesus since, since Jesus himself was barely known outside of Nazareth and Capernaum. And if he was known, he was known to start with as the carpenter of Nazareth. And here's Peter saying, I call him, not Jesus of Nazareth, but I call him the Lord Jesus. Something about this, this man has impressed me. that I call him Lord. I've seen what he's done. I've heard what he's said. I've seen what's been done to him. I've seen, I saw him die on the cross. But I, I, I've seen him risen from the dead as well. He's not like just the carpenter of Nazareth. He's the Lord Jesus. That's who he is. And that's who, if you're a Christian today, that's who you're living for. And that's who saved you. And that's who you're proclaiming to the people around you. Oh, d don't, don't let your conversation just in, drop into calling him Jesus. He's the Lord Jesus. Keep that in your mind all the time. The Lord Jesus. And so Peter is saying here, we believe... We believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus. That's who Jesus is, this divine name. Peter has seen the divine nature bursting through even the human nature of this Jesus that he's lived alongside and so when he comes to write later in, in his letter, he, he talks about the time when they were up on that mountain, what we call the transfiguration, and he saw the glory of God shining through the Lord Jesus. That's who Jesus is. Uh, but what did he do? It's all tied to his death, isn't it? His death from the cross and his resurrection. That was no ordinary death. And <laughs> that was no ordinary execution. Peter can say, yes. He's, we're saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only who he is, but what he's done. He died on the cross. No, nobody had died on a cross before. So, so what's, what's my religious background to this? We might ask Peter. What, what, what is the religious background? Why do you get so involved with thinking about Jesus dying on the cross? How, how does that link in with any hope of salvation you've got? And Peter could say, well, remember, I'm a Jew. And my background is one of sacrifice. My background of the religion that I grew up with is to do with sacrificing and, and lambs and blood being shed. And when I think of my Savior Jesus on the cross, I think of those lambs. And those lambs were substitutes. That's the whole basis of our religion. As we look back through our scriptures, the Jewish scriptures, what we call the Old Testament, Peter can say, the lamb. And in the early days of Jesus' ministry, when, when he went to be baptized by John the Baptist, we were really struck by those words that John the Baptist said that didn't really make sense to us at the time. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so Peter can say, yes, we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus. The Lord, who he is, but what he did as well, how he, he took that position on the cross as our substitute. Grace. Well, Peter, that might work for you. But what about us? We're Gentiles. It all seems to make sense to you because you can say that Jesus is Lord and you're using the, the Jewish divine name for him there, so you believe that he's, he's God. And you believe that Jesus is a sort of lamb, a substitute, uh, dying in the place of sinners. But that's all very Jewish, isn't it? What, how does that affect us? And that's where the last words of verse 11 are so important for us. We believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. Who's they? 
who's they? Well, he was talking as a Jewish Christian of the first century, and so he's talking about the non-Jews of his own day, the, the Gentiles, the, the people from, from the Roman Empire, the, the Greeks, the barbarians, the Scythians, all of them. And wherever Paul and Barnabas had gone, taking the gospel around Cyprus and Asia Minor, and they'd seen Gentile people coming to faith, Peter is saying, yes, them, just as they are. But uh, looking down the years, that they includes you in Swansea. He'd never heard of Swansea. But he's saying, we believe that we Jewish Christians here in Jerusalem, those Jewish and Gentile Christians 300 miles away in Antioch, that mixed bag of people converted in other places in bits of the Roman Empire. <laughs> I can say this coming from Cardiff. These barbarians! <laughs> these barbarians! We're saved, they're saved. And it's exactly the same ground. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's, he's already said in verse 9, there is no distinction. He did not discriminate. There's a good modern word, isn't there? No discrimination between them and us. It's the same way of salvation. For the Romans, the Greeks, the barbarians, the Swansiaites, as well as the Jewish people of Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. The first Jewish disciples were saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus. The first Roman and Greek disciples were saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus. People throughout time have been saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus. People all over the world today are being saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus. And you too can be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus. In fact, you too need to be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, and you too can be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus. And what I would love to hear is that by this afternoon, everybody in this chapel now could confidently say, we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus. Can you give that same answer? Can you give that same answer? As you leave the, this morning, chew over it, perhaps worry over it, but by the end of the day, may God grant that each one of us with full confidence can say, yes, we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they are. Amen.